great to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you today about what Resolute Marine Energy is doing in the wave energy sector. We're a company that's only eight people here in Boston. We started in 2006 and we're developing wave energy converters that take the kinetic energy out in the ocean and turn it into some, some kind of a useful power source. We have a very interesting uh, sort of initial commercial uh, application for it. Let me just change the slide here. Okay. Um, interesting commercial application for it that we're starting with, which is using the power of the ocean to actually take the salt out of the water and give it to people who need it around the world. So, um, as Susan probably schooled you on this this, uh, this morning, um, the ocean is an incredible, incredible place providing climate control, the air that we breathe, food. It also can provide energy, and that energy, once again, can be used to desalinate seawater for people who, once again, really need it. So today, I'll be successful. I'm going to geek out on you for a little while with, you know, just sort of explaining of how it works and what it is, and I will deem myself successful if I walk out of here and people go, aha, I understand how this works. Uh, cool, we ought to be looking out into the ocean for some energy. So, so let's start with benefits and challenges of the whole wave energy world. Um, clearly, it's a clean resource. It's abundant. Uh, it's all over the world. You'll see a slide in a second that sort of says where the wave energy is. But according to the electric uh, uh, EPRI uh, here in the United States, Waves alone can supply about 7 to 8% of the total electricity requirements of our nation. Uh, that number goes up to 10% according to the Carbon Trust over in the UK. There's a lot of it. One of the things that people forget is that wave energy is nearby. So, uh, for example, in the United States, 80% of the electric demand on the grid is taken up by the 28 coastal states. That includes the Great Lakes states as well. In the world, roughly 50% of the population lives within 100 miles of the coastline. So although it is often twice as expensive to move energy from the ocean onshore, when you're talking about transmission distances of 10, year, 10 miles, for example, rather than hundreds of miles, as is the case with some of the proposals that we're looking at today, you can see that it might make sense. The other key thing to understand about the benefit of wave energy, it's very, very predictable and consistent, and you'll see a graph uh, coming up pretty soon that explains exactly how that works. But you can know what kind of wave energy is going to come to your particular array or your device days in advance. Surfers are very aware of this. They are really hip to the NOAA buoy system where they can look out in the Pacific Ocean and say, aha, big waves going by, three days later, Redondo Beach, I'm there. Uh, so, um, anyway, so, that, so it's very, very predictable and consistent. So when, and again, another slide, you'll see how waves are made, but it's basically stored uh, wind energy. And when the wind quits, the waves are still going, and that has some pretty interesting uh, economic effects. There are challenges in the industry that we face. Uh, I've divided them up into two kind of general categories, technical and market-related. Um, clearly, survivability is uh, number one. Um, when you have a hurricane come or when you have that dreaded 100-year storm that always seems to come two years after you've put your stuff in the water, um, that's what you have to worry about. It's a very rough environment out there. Reliability is an issue. Uh, you know, you, particularly in the ocean environment, it's not easy to get out there, very expensive to you know, maintain these things. So they have to last a long time. And then we've got to start down the cost curve. We're way, way behind solar and, uh, well, not so much solar, but wind, let's say, for example, uh, in terms of the cost per kilowatt hour that's coming out. Market-related issues affect us very much as well. Um, regulation here in the United States is kind of a patchwork, and I'll talk about that in a second as well. Uh, incentives and disincentives are also needed in order to promote the industry and get us started down the path. Um, some of the incentives include feed-in tariffs, potentially, investment tax credits, production tax credits. Some of the disincentives, which we got to have, is a price on carbon. So um, anyway, that's one. The other is uh, standards, which uh, no bank or insurance company will finance any type of a renewable energy project unless they know precisely 
what equipment's going to go into place, has it been tested, how will it you know, perform, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's uh, one of the uh, market-related challenges. I should point out that the wind industry went through exactly these problems 10, 15, 20 years ago when they were getting started. So I'm kind of fond of saying the wave energy industry is like the wind industry you know, 10 years ago. So here's, uh, we start sort of tech stuff, how waves are made. Effectively, it's all about the wind blowing over the surface of the water. And uh, the longer the fetch or the, the, the amount of time that wind is blowing over a surface of water, the bigger the waves will be. The uh, size of the waves are affected also by what's on the bottom in terms of the bottom topography. And it's also affected by currents and tides and so on and so forth. So that's why wind, I mean, waves are effectively stored wind energy. Here's where wave energy is around the world. Uh, those uh, intense red bands that both in the north and the southern he hemisphere. By and large, um, any place you see a number that's 20 or higher, that's a commercially viable area. This isn't a ter terribly accurate map, I'll admit. But let me give you an example of what 20 means. 20 means the average annual kilowatts that's available at that particular location. So, and that's measured across a lineal meter. So there's, if, if for example, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, you've got 20 kilowatts going through this little meter of area, you can power 10 houses, average houses for the year using that, using that energy from just one meter. Wave energy is 800 times as energy dense as wind, for example, so you get the idea. The biggest waves, of course, are in the southern hemisphere, what they call the roaring 40s. If you've ever sailed down there, it's intense. Um, so those are, those are biggies, they really are. Uh, just a quick snapshot of the U.S. Uh, leading the pack in terms of uh, availability of wave energy is the Alaska coast. Not a great place because there's no load centers up there. So. Then next, uh, next behind, behind that is the California, Oregon, Washington coastline. Great re wave resources out there. The utility, Pacific Gas and Electric, is indeed uh, starting to develop a project out there uh, of which we're you know, a candidate to supply some wave energy converters for them. And then Hawaii, and then the East Coast is a little bit, uh, a little bit less, uh, less energetic. But we're planning to do our testing regime starting next summer, our ocean testing regime, I should say, starting next summer uh, up in Maine, which is a perfectly fine uh, wave climate. This is basically a demonstration of the predictability of wave energy. Again, this is a, those plots are basically uh, across a number of years, and you can see they track each other very, very closely. It also shows that there's some seasonality in wave energy, that in the winter months, basically, there's a lot more energy than in the summer months. So it's kind of now segueing into sort of the, envir the business environment that we're operating in as we try to get this company going. It's a very competitive arena. On the upper left-hand corner, that's meant to be a picture of a diesel generator set. When we get to the commercial application of desalinating seawater, that's our number one competition. We need to displace those people, that, that technology, if you will. Um, and then, of course, uh, with a, an adequate or a good price on carbon, we'll start to see the coal people up in the upper, uh, you know, coal becoming more expensive, and, or, or let, me say, let me say rationally priced. We also are in competition with other renewables for funding. The big funding source for our industry at this point in time is the U.S. Department of Energy. We've been, uh, thank goodness, uh, recipients of funding from DOE to do our basic re uh, research and development work. Um, so we also operate in a very complex regulatory environment. Part of that is because uh, there's no private property. The ocean is not private property. It's a public good. And therefore, there's a lot of different stakeholders out there that all must be attended to. So there's a long list of basic you know, ocean stewardship things that we need to pay attention to. Uh, I'll just point out that we also have, at last count, about 15 dig different regulatory agencies that all must conspire in order to get a project approved. And we as an industry are working to try to get that streamlined a little bit. But that's another reality of our industry. This I call the um, sort of, uh, how should we say, make you jealous Cape Wind slide, if you will. Uh, <laughs> we had a photo montage done of 
10 of our wave energy converters deployed 500 meters offshore, and that's what it looks like. So, you know. <laughs> so, now sort of segueing into sort of typical deployment scenarios for this stuff. Um, this is what a typical wave farm would look like. There's obviously four different technologies depicted in the upper left, but it's all basically the same. The energy is, is captured from the waves at those devices, transmitted to the bottom where it's collected, sent on shore on a, uh, you know, a high voltage uh, DC or AC uh, transmission line, and then fed into the grid. Pretty straightforward. Now I'm going to go through some of the different designs that are out there so that you get a feeling for who's doing what and how they work and so on. There's a type of uh, wave energy call, uh, converter called an attenuator. Uh, this is the first company that gained sort of notoriety for a project, a commercial project they had off the coast of Portugal, Palamas. It's a Scottish company. That device, basically, think of a series of hinged rafts that are going like this in reaction to the, to the waves going by. And at those joints, there's a terrific amount of energy that can be captured by hydraulic rams, effectively. Next type is called a terminator. Any type of device that's called a terminator stops waves, so therefore it's got a, some interesting sort of uh, anchoring issues to keep it in place. This is the wave dragon that basically is a collector that concentrates waves that are coming in like this, and they basically get bigger, bigger, bigger as they come in, and they jump on a ramp, and they go into a tank, and then gravity drives it through a hydroelectric turbine. Pretty straightforward, once again. The engineering challenges, is, this is, there's no real science associated with getting this industry going. No new elements need to be discovered, etc. These are all basic you know, run-of-the-mill engineering challenges that we have. Here's another type of terminator that actually makes electricity by driving a column of air through a plenum and then through an, a turbine, effectively. And the wave comes in and one side, the fact that it's going up and down moves the air column and the air goes through the plenum and turns a turbine. Here is a point absorber type. This is one of the kinds that we're focused on developing. This is a company called Ocean Power Technologies. Uh, this is their power buoy. This, as for reference, is, puts out about 150 kilowatts when it's deployed. Here's how it works. The float kind of models the surface of the ocean as the waves go by. It bobs up and down. The heave plate on the bottom keeps the very lower portion of the device stable. So you have this kind of action. You have that change of distance between the two things. There's a great deal of energy to be captured there. Here's how it's deployed. Just flood one compartment and whoops, up it goes. Um, here's the final one. This is called a surge converter. This is the only bottom-mounted type of device that's out there, um, or, or genotype, if you will, of wave energy converter. Aquamarine is another Scottish company. By the way, the Brits are way ahead of us in this, this world. Makes a lot of sense because they're surrounded by ocean, and it's one of their best renewable energy resources. So this device puts out, I think, 500 kilowatts, this particular. And you, if you can see the people, you get a sense of how big it is. And this is how basically they're doing it. That sits on the bottom, once again, reacts to waves going by, pressurizes seawater, goes to a hydroelectric turbine on shore, electricity produced, there you go. So they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so we decided to develop a flapping or surge type device as well. Only our application for it is to drive a desalination system. And uh, there's some advantages to being very close to shore in terms of deployment and so on and so forth. But basically, our device flaps back and forth, pressurizes seawater, which is again used to drive a reverse osmosis desalination system. We're just developing the wave energy converter. We have a partner that's working on developing the uh, RO system. That's pretty much off-the-shelf technology. Very, very attractive because it can be deployed quickly. It can be scaled bigger very easily. It does produce a competitive water cost, not at the lowest rate, but again, there's a lot of places in the world where it's a pretty cheap option. It has minimal environmental impact because you're actually using seawater as the power source and you're recombining the permeate with it to, de to, de to put it back into the ocean, so it's got a very low concentration. Uh, so. Why would we focus on that kind of thing? Well, because there's a big problem with shortage of water around the world. 
You know, over a billion people uh, around the world lack access to adequate supplies of fresh water. Um, you know, several millions uh, die per year from, uh, you know, unnecessarily from preventable diseases. It's a big source of conflict around the world. Interestingly enough, as we dove into it, um, it's a problem that unfairly, or uh, how should we say, m more affects uh, women and children around the world because they're the ones that are tasked with the job of, uh, of fetching water. So it's a biggie. And as we looked around the world, we said, where with any of these countries that aren't green uh, should we focus our activities? And we decided to focus on South Africa. Why South Africa? Well, they have a great deal of water scarcity in certain areas. They have uh, a very, very strong political will to right many of the problems that were started with apartheid, to give adequate supplies of electricity, water to some of those um, you know, uh, uh, black communities. Uh, and they have the, the ability to pay. We've actually been over there and uh, spent a lot of time. I won't go through the mathematics because I don't have much time, but it's a very, very big marketplace. Anywhere you see those red dots, that's a, a viable area for us. There's a lot of wave resource around the whole coast of, of Africa. Here's the spot where we have been working uh, with a particular community, and that's where we would deploy those flapping wave energy converters just outside the surf zone there. Pipes come on shore. There's a basic tank of fresh water that they can take away at will. Just a quick bit of history of how we've developed. This is a, a product that we, or a wave energy converter that we've stopped working on. It was funded by NOAA. It was meant to produce compressed air to supply power for the aquaculture industry. So there's another application for wave energy that can be very, very positive. So uh, this is really my last slide. Um, and I just want to give you a sense of where we think offshore energy is going. And my bet is, and this is why we're developing that 3D WEC device, is that the offshore wave energy project of the future is going to be a hybrid of offshore wind turbines and waves. There are a lot of reasons in terms of uh, streamlined permitting processes, uh, shared infrastructure, and so on. But the major thing goes back to that predictability and consistency. When the wind isn't blowing, that whole project is still producing electricity, and that actually has some economic impact for the buyer of the electricity or the electrons that are coming off of that. So that's basically it. I just wanted to give you a sense of what we're doing, something about wave energy. Uh, that uh, Water, Water Everywhere piece came from a Coleridge poem that basically is Water, Water Everywhere nor any drop to drink, and we disagree strongly. So thank you very much. Thank you.